For today's classic interview, we go back to my interview with maybe one of the better known medical ethicists uh, in the United States today, Arthur Kaplan. We spoke about the morality of genetic editing, and there's a couple different connections here. One is that in the last two years, the advancements of the CRISPR project have been significant. And the type of genetic editing that Arthur and I discussed during the interview is in a sense already a reality, but going to be mainstreamed as a possibility very, very soon. And it's also been 40 years since the beginning of in vitro fertilization, which is not genetic editing in any of the senses that I discussed with Art Kaplan, but it is in a sense sort of the catalyst from which much of the current medical technology around genetic editing uh, maybe came from in some sense. So I think what is interesting to think about is when you watch this interview, listen to this interview I did with Art back in January of 2016, do our views seem almost quaintly outdated in some way? In other words, have things advanced so much in terms of our perception of the issue of genetic editing that a conversation that's two and a half years old seems almost outdated in terms of modern sensibilities? Back to January of 2016, when I interviewed medical ethicist Arthur Kaplan. It's great to welcome back to the program Arthur Kaplan, director of the Division of Medical Ethics at NYU Langone Medical Center. We've been talking increasingly about genetic editing, and we covered the story of the one-year-old girl with leukemia whose life was, at least for the time being, saved by the first procedure where genetically edited ce uh, cells from a donor were implanted into her. And of course, as soon as we start talking about this, the emails pour in about the ethical and moral considerations of genetic editing. Let's start at sort of the broadest point. When you think about genetic editing, what are the, the moral and ethical concerns that you have, or at least that you most frequently hear cited? Well, there are really two kinds of genetic editing. One is to change cells, either modify cells and put them into the uh, body, as it was done with a little girl, or to try and use viruses to insert genetic material into cells. Say someone with cystic fibrosis who has a genetic mistake, you're trying to get viruses to insert corrected material right into the lungs of the person. There's also genetic editing that takes place to eliminate diseases that are inherited. There you're trying to modify embryos, you're trying to change the DNA, correct errors there so that the disease is not passed on to a child or to grandchildren or to any descendants. The first kind of genetic editing is called somatic cells, body cells. They're not inherited. You're fixing something in a person. It's controversial because there are certainly safety considerations. People have died in the middle of these experiments. There's some controversy about whether or not it's right to try and repair diseases using genetic engineering when we don't have enough animal data, but because some of these diseases, animals don't get them. But overall, I think genetically editing body cells is fairly widely accepted. It makes sense in that it's the individual who has to make the choice about whether they want to take the risk. The benefits may or may not follow. People understand when they have terrible diseases that they may die in these experiments. But I think overall, the verdict has been review them carefully, make sure the science is sound, make sure the informed consent is good, and let them proceed. Where you really get pushback is when people are trying to change embryos, change things that are passed on. And people that's, say, uh, that, that's, I've received people who, emails from people who seem to have completely opposite views on that. Some say, if you're going to make changes that would lead to subsequent generations, in other words, the children of those whose embryos are changed, not requiring the same edit. In other words, eliminating something that would be inherited, that's good. And others say, no, 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 that's not good because you're actually making changes to subsequent generations and they have sort of no choice over that. So it's interesting that I've received feedback from people uh, with very, very divergent views on that particular issue. Well, I think when we're talking about changing inherited DNA, yeah. modifying our descendants, there's really a couple of ethical concerns that the critics have. One is you just don't cross that line because the people affected can't consent. You're 
future daughter, your unborn grandchild, they can't say, I'll take the risk, try to fix my sickle cell disease, my hemophilia, my cystic fibrosis, whatever it is, I can't give you my permission. I have to say to that objection, I'm not impressed with that worry. I think parents make decisions for children all the time. We make them for newborns all the time. We do prenatal screening all the time. Absolutely. The fact is, you know, people make choices for their descendants, and that's just a reality. Absolutely. So now that we've said that you don't feel that that is a strong argument against that type of decision, what does strike you as a stronger argument there, or at least one we should uh, pay more attention to? I think when we're talking about genetic changes for heredity, looming over that area is the experience of Germany with eugenics, with trying to eliminate people who are disabled, weak, seen as burdens on society, seen as racially inferior. In our current world, it's, we're, we're hardly over racism, uh, bigotry, and uh, views that are anti-disability. So when people say, I want to get rid of bad things in future generations, part of the argument is, well, what is a bad thing? It's one thing to say, I don't want to pass on Tay-Sachs disease. Okay, that's going to kill the child, and it makes sense. I think it's hard to argue against that. It's another thing to say, I want to get rid of Asperger's, or I'm not sure I want to have a short child. Those sorts of things are differences. Are they diseases? Are they really problems that make people unhappy? So one key issue then becomes identify what it is you're talking about. How do you know when something really is a disease or just a difference? It's clearly some people, for example, in the deaf community would say being deaf isn't a disease. It's a difference. We have our own language. We have our own colleges. We live happy lives. We contribute to society. You don't have to eliminate deafness. That's not something you have to genetically engineer out of the human species. Then the related issue is, what about the people who say, hey, great, as long as we can get rid of lethal or terrible diseases, why don't we improve ourselves? Why don't we make stronger, taller, faster, smarter kids? When you can do genetic changes that repair disease, you can also do genetic changes that enhance or improve, quote unquote, future generations. So I think the objections that we have to pay attention to are, how do we define what it is that we might try to fix without getting rid of all human diversity and just having, you know, uh, some perfect stereotype of the quote unquote healthy descendant? And then are we ready to go down a path that might open the door to really trying to improve our species? How would you define or how could we as a society figure out whether there is a sort of I don't know, approved list of what we can, quote, mm -hmm. fix or change. I mean, some people emailed me saying, listen, David, uh, this is going to happen sooner or later. The medical community is going to improve on these techniques. This is going to be available. Does it not make more sense to regulate and sort of have some approved list of procedures that you can and can't do? But then the problem is who is in charge of deciding and what would be a sort of moral and ethical way to decide what is and is not allowed? Well, I think those comments are right on point. If you say ban it, no changes, nothing allowed that's hereditary, right. it's not, it's not going to happen. Plenty of other countries, China, Singapore, many places in the world are going to be doing and using this technology to engineer diseases out of their children. It will take place. If the United States says, for example, no federal funds for embryo engineering, which right now is what we're saying, the major tool that the government has to impose regulations, to come up with that list, to designate a panel to do it, goes away. There's no federal funding. There's no lever to uh, push on to make uh, regulation possible. So what will happen here is a private market. The rich will drive what the technology does. Private companies will set up. They're not accountable to almost anyone in terms of the services they offer, by the way. That's what the infertility field looks like today, right. a private market where single people, older people, you name it, anybody can use the services and the clinics put in five embryos, six embryos, Optomom, et cetera. So we know what awaits us if we don't try to keep government funding present in order in part 
to allow us to shape or control the evolution of the technology. Look, I think it's silly to argue that we're not going to see efforts made to get rid of Tay-Sachs and breast cancer and prostate cancer and hemophilia and uh, many, many other heritable diseases. No one is going to hold those people hostage for very long out of fears that we don't know where to draw the line. So we better be ready for a world in which people at some point, if not tomorrow, in a few years, start to engineer embryos to get rid of awful, clearly terrible diseases. Can you give, then, us, a, can you give us a sense, though, if, if it were up to you to sort of create a, a test or a question to decide, OK, uh, eliminating hemophilia, uh, making someone taller than they might be based on the two parents that they have, giving someone better than 2020 vision. What sort of questions could we apply to determine whether a particular change should or should not be allowed or is or is not ethical? So at one end, we know that there are diseases that shorten lifespan and really contribute to clear dysfunction. And by the way, deafness and blindness are on that list for me. Mm. I understand why people say they can exist, either deaf or blind, and have great lives. But it's clear that not seeing and not hearing, these are dysfunctional states, and we could repair them. Sure. So better to be able to do them than not do them. It's not part of the issue then becomes if we're going to go after these clearly dysfunctional, clearly life shortening diseases, we better be careful to put in laws that say we're still going to support and respect people who don't choose to do this. Remember, it's not just a question of where do we draw the line? What if you say, I'm not going to fix cystic fibrosis in my kid. I'm going to have kids with diseases. Is the public going to turn around and say, hey, look, you could have fixed that. You chose not to. We're not paying for your health care. We're not paying for any disability programs. The blame's on you. You want to have kids that are sick, quote unquote, not my problem. A big looming issue in a society that's becoming more and more individualistic. But to answer your question, I think each case has to be done on its merits. You're not going to find a single criteria that says, ah, that's in or that's out. Somebody might say, you know, freckles, let's get rid of them. And I think it's pretty clear we give an argument that says they don't affect lifespan, they don't affect dysfunction, they're just an appearance issue or a preference. We're not going to permit changes that allow us to eliminate freckling. I'm sure people are going to look at albinism. Albinos in our culture, a predominantly white society, not really discriminated against, not seen as the worst thing that can happen in a lot of societies, Japan, Africa, albinism is a terrible disease. Mm. They stigmatize it. They want nothing to do with it. So I think it's going to have to be case by case, the burden on those to prove why it is that they want to have the disease eliminated. That's how I would handle it. I try to do it with a fair process, not so much a set of criteria that say, if you fulfill this, you get it. If you don't, you won't. Because I think it's going to change from place to place. And I think it's going to change, if you will, from economic situation to economic situation and so on. Absolutely fascinating, super important questions that at some point will need to be answered. We've been speaking with Arthur Kaplan, director of the Division of Medical Ethics at NYU Langone Medical Center. Thanks so much for joining me again. Thank you for having me.